7.01, I'm going to go ahead and call this meeting to order. Will the recorder please call the roll? Present. Councillor Irvin? Here. Councillor Fleck? Here. Councillor Meriday? Here. Councillor Savage? Councillor Stennett? Here. Mayor Solsby? Here. I'll rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Items to be added to the agenda? I see none. Appearance of interested citizens for items not on the agenda, and we actually have had no one sign up to speak tonight. Public hearings? We have none. Consent agenda? Move approval. Councilor Irvin. I'm not sure if it got changed, but in our agenda session, there was a addition to add Councillor Fleck was present at one of them. So I don't know if we need to amend the the motion to that. It's changed on my original copy. I just didn't reprint for all seven of you. Uh, thank you. Right. So we have a motion with the second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? None. Resolutions and ordinances, we have none. Business from the City Council. Item A, a presentation from student consultants from the University of Oregon regarding the proposed recreation district. Staff report by City Planner, Mr. Mongan. Good evening, thank you, Mayor and Council. We have tonight a presentation uh, from the student consultants of the real world Lane County course at the University of Oregon. Um, they're gonna do their presentation here, which is about 10 minutes, and then a couple of minutes for questions after that. I would just ask that uh, council remember that they're not necessarily subject matter experts on what the rec district is actually doing. This was a study just looking at what the community interest or disinterest or palette is for uh, the establishment of the rec district. And so with that, I'll bring up the presentation and called student consultants. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I'm Carrie and we are students with the University of Oregon and we've been working with city planning staff with the city of Cottage Grove as well as the South Lane Park and Recreation uh, Steering Committee to make this proposal. Next slide, please. So a little bit about the rest of our presentation. We'll be going into the context into our project as well as the purpose, the methodology we used for our report and the findings from our interviews and our survey. And we'll end off with the recommendations that we supplied to the steering committee. Next slide. So a little bit of context, this project started because a community group identified a need for unified resources and overall a lack of park and recreation resources in South Lane County. And so the South Lane Steering Committee for the Parks and Rec District was created to create a proposal for the district and begin to get signatures for the November 2024 ballot. And so as students, we created a survey to create um, or find out community interest in the district and any reservations they might have. Next slide. So what we were researching was if people would be willing to pay for a Sparks and Rec district and if it was worth the steering committee moving forward and crafting their proposal and getting more signatures. And secondarily, we were really interested in finding out any programs and activities that the community was mainly interested in seeing in our district. Next slide. Next slide, please. So our methodology, we created a community survey that reached about 339 responses and we distributed it three ways. The first was through the social media Facebook websites and flyers that were distributed in English and in Spanish throughout downtown Cottage Grove, as well as local schools and churches, and postcards that were mailed out to 4,000 random addresses of residents in Dorina, Cottage Grove, and London. And we also created or did informational interviews with 10 community stakeholders to identify how a Parks and Rec district might affect their services as well as get, gain their knowledge of the community to address the, um, 
or gauge the interests and reservations of the community. Next slide, please. And as Carrie mentioned, we conducted 10 informational interviews with various stakeholders. Next slide, please. And um, the stakeholders that were referred to us were people in the community who had a high level of involvement, who were familiar with re the relevant stakeholder groups and also had background knowledge of community interests and the services in, that are existing in the community and services that the community could look to expand. And the main interview themes that we found were that 30% of interviewees mentioned um, a community tax reservation from people in the community and that there could that the community could use more youth programming. In addition to this, 20% of the interviewees um, mentioned how the community could use increased accessibility and how more services could be offered in the community, more specifically rural services and health services. Next slide, please. And we also pulled multiple quotes from these from these stakeholders. And one quote that stood out stood out was from Rob Dickinson, who is on the steering committee for sustainable cottage growth. And he mentioned how quality of life is better when we find the things we need and people will be healthier and the community will be healthier if we have more recreational opportunities. And this essentially expanded on the idea that this recreation district will be able to benefit everyone in, in Cottage Grove. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'd like to go over some of our survey responses. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So again, the survey was open during the month of February. We collected about 339 responses. And looking at our results, we first wanted to understand um, what age our respondents were and where they were located. Um, so first we have age as highlighted above. Um, I just wanted to highlight um, one key finding that we had from this um, age range was that uh, we had a significant amount of seniors, 65 plus, take the survey. For reference, the U.S. Census Bureau identifies about 17% of the population in the area being of this age range. However, we had about 33% um, in our survey. But we do appreciate everyone that took the survey, no matter their age. We just want to know that this might skew some of our data towards interests for those people that are in those age ranges. Next slide, please. In terms of location, we asked respondents to identify where they lived in according to the South Lane School District. About 40% of our respondents lived in the Harrison District and 40% in the Bohemia. And then about the remaining 20% was divided among the other three. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of how respondents currently use the parks, overall, our respondents um, use the parks for a wide variety of services. However, it's most popular in terms of exercise, quiet and relaxation, and entertainment. Next slide, please. We then asked respondents to rate how satisfied they are with the various services currently offered. Um, respondents were most satisfied with landscaping at 62% and most dissatisfied with safety at 42%. However, in most categories such as sports, maintenance, landscaping, and trails, and yeah, uh, in these categories, respondents were overall more satisfied than dissatisfied. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of reasons for not using a park, so essentially we asked respondents how often they use a park, and for those that said they use a park less than once a month, we asked them why they did not use a park, and so that was about 90 of our 339 responses. And out of those respondents, 31% cited feeling unsafe, and then 17% cited either like condition of facilities or inadequate facilities. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of areas that would like to see more support, we had overall a similar um, number of, I guess, responses in each category. So those were parks, paths, trails, and open spaces, after school and summer youth programs, adult and senior services, youth sports and recreation programs, and public safety. And then we had a little bit less interest in terms of playgrounds and childcare. And again, this is where I bring up the um, significant amount of 65 plus because 
those that are of that age usually offer their own child care, so they do not need a Parks and Recreation District to offer child care for them. Thank you. Next slide. So with, within our survey, we really wanted to know why people would be likely to use the district. And within each of our questions, we identified some really big themes. One of the biggest reasons people said that they would like to see a recreation district is because they identified the big benefit that it would add to the community. It would offer a wider variety of recreational services that don't exist in South Plain. Um, another big finding that we found was because the majority of people that took our survey were seniors and adults, they specified that if there were activities that were offered for their age group and interest, they would be more than likely to use the district. Because the biggest age group that took our survey were 65 and plus, we found that 59% of them wanted to see these types of services. From our survey, we found that the majority of people that took it didn't have a child under 18 under their care. However, we did find that the majority of participants did identify a need for child care and youth services in South Lane. And if the recreation district were to provide those types of services, they would be in support of it. We found that the biggest age group that wanted to see these types of services were people aged from 35 to 44. Next slide, please. So from our survey, we did find that the majority of people that took it did want to see a park and recreation recreation district. However, when it came to paying for it, there was a bit of a pushback. We did find that 44% were willing to pay. When we find when we found this out, we really wanted to know where these people were located in South Lane and how old they were for future educa educational campaign purposes. Next slide. We found that the area that was the most likely to want a parking recreation district and support it was Bohemia coming in at 53% and the area that was the least likely to support the district was Harrison coming in at 47%. Next slide, please. We found that the age group that was the most likely to support the district was people from 35 to 44 coming in at 54% and respondents that were aged from 55 to 64 were the least likely to support the district. People aged 65 and plus that were the biggest age group um, the results were relatively split in half. Next slide, please. So I will be discussing our final recommendations. The first category is specifically about this ballot initiative. And the first recommendation we have for our steering committee is to push this initiative from the, May, the November 2024 election to the May 2025 election, as our survey findings indicate the community is not ready right now for the, to vote on this proposal. This will give the steering committee and the community plenty of time for a public education campaign, which can include the creation of informational and promotional materials, not only to garner more support throughout the community, but also to ensure that the community is aware of what this district is aiming to do. Um, additionally, we encourage more community outreach um, amongst the steering committee, whether that be informational sessions hosted throughout with the community groups or going to specific stakeholder groups and seeing what they would like to know more about. Uh, we also recommend the steering committee look into further surveying that would target younger audiences and also potentially expand the area to more areas of interest in this district. A portion of this public education campaign and a big thing that this group recommends going forward is that the steering committee focus on creating a business plan that will not only educate the community on how exactly this district will run in terms of programming and budgets and the future, but will also include a marketing campaign so that taxpayers are aware of what their taxes are being used for and what it is they're spending money on. Next slide, please. In terms of recommendations of the specific community interests, we found the majority of our respondents the biggest reservation they had about this district is they were concerned it simply would not be useful to them. To combat this, we recommend an emphasis on adult programming and services to help accommodate to the older populations who are looking for more programming, as well as flexible fees for senior and older populations in order to account for their less likely, less, in order to account for them being less likely to be willing to pay, um, which is precedented in several other parks and recreation districts. In terms of programming, we saw that people generally were looking for updated facilities and increased trail accessibility with the note that when there's more programming going on in parks um, and there's more usage, there is less deviant misusage of the spaces. Next slide. So thank you so much for listening. We would love to answer any questions you may have for us. Any questions? Councillor Flack. Thank you. Get used to this button. Um, so out of curiosity, were there any respondents from the rural areas outside of the city of Cottage Grove? 
Yes. Because I, re if I remember from the census data, that's roughly about the same number as within the city limits. So it's quite a quite a large sample of folks. We have people who are in survey. We had twenty eight people from Darina take the survey. Fourteen people from London and seven from Latham. Latham. Thank you so yeah. much. Any other questions? Anyone else? Councillor Urban. Thank you. Well done, each of you. Um, what do you attribute the lack of respondents from adult, young adults down to be? Is it the, the methodology of issuing the, the surveys? We, so we had sent out 4,000 postcards, but there was an issue, the, we had like a QR code on it and it was sent out during the time of the ice storm and the post the post office had like put a sticker over the QR code. So that was one of our biggest setbacks, I feel like, from pushing up the survey. Um, we also considered going through the school board and trying to get flyers sent home with students to target younger audiences, but just due to timing and the scope of our specific project, we weren't able to accomplish that. So that would be a recommendation for further surveying. Thank you. Councillor Durr. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> I appreciate your presentation. And I wonder, did you find voter turnout to help you identify why May 2025 will be better than November 2024? So um, that recommendation is based more on just the time needed to prepare this ballot initiative. Um, given the setbacks with the ice storm, um, the steering committee is slightly behind where their original goal was. And so we found that it was just, it would be better for the community overall um, to push the ballot to a later date so that voters were aware of what would be, what they were voting on. Councilor Meriday. Yes, thank you very much for your work. Um, this is um, an issue that uh, every, I think everybody agrees, yeah, we would like to see something like this, but the main difference uh, of opinion comes to how to pay for it. And is that, that seems to be reflected in your results, right? That we're, we like the idea, we're just not that keen about paying for it. Yes, we would agree with that. Thank you for all your hard work, it shows. Thank you. Thank you. All right, item B, Urban Forestry Committee Appointments, staff report by City Planner, Mr. Munkin. Thank you, Mayor, Council. Um, at this time, uh, I believe Councilor Mary Day will present um, the two recommended Mem uh, applicants for consideration of the full council. Was it Councilor Meridi or Councilor Fleck? I think it was Councilor oh, Fleck. Oh, Councilor Fleck. I apologize. Um, with uh, the two applicants being Justin Tidrick and uh, Richard Vasquez for terms, three-year terms beginning today that would end on December 31st, 2026. Well, we have some challenges in interviews and I don't think any of us actually made all of them or both of the, or both of these. And so um, uh, we drew lots to see who would make the recommendation. Uh, there's no reflection on our candidates. These both are wonderful folks who are gonna be great representatives uh, for this committee. And so um, if I can make a motion, I will move that uh, um, we appoint the uh, two urban forestry uh, committee members uh, for the remaining portion of the three-year terms expiring on December 31st, 2026, and those are Justin Tidrick and Richard Vasquez. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion with a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. I see none. Motion carries. Item C, 
Budget Officer Appointment Staff Report by Finance Director, Ms. Likens. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, the city is required by RS-294 to appoint a budget officer either um, by the governing body or as designated in your, the city's charter. Um, our charter indicates that the city manager is to prepare and administer the annual city budget, but it doesn't specifically call them out as the budget officer. So in my conversations with Kerry, we decided it would be um, beneficial to actually appoint the city manager as your budget officer, and that is staff's recommendation. Councilor Fleck. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I move that uh, we appoint our city manager, Mike Sarwine, as the budget officer. Second. We have a motion with a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries, unanimous. Item D, Zipley Franchise Agreement Discussion, Staff Report by Assistant City Manager, Mr. Boone, and City Planner, Mr. Mongan. Good evening, thank you uh, again, Mayor and Council. So uh, just a quick overview following up um, on the discussion that was had at the previous City Council meeting regarding uh, Zipley Fiber and their request uh, for under or a component of the development code not applying, uh, I guess if you will, um, as they negotiate their franchise agreement to uh, provide services here in the City of Cottage Grove. Um, staff felt that it was important um, to just do a quick little refresher on the development code um, just to kind of highlight how it's separate from this action um, and then we'll lead to uh, further discussion with Mr. Boone. Uh, so Title 14 of the Codge Grove Municipal Code is the development code as is highlighted here. Um, the relevant sections for this conversation are highlighted below and that's division three um, and then specifically chapter 14.34 um, again uh, the real meat of this discussion is is the applicability statement that exists in the code it's very important that when we're considering any anything in the development code we understand first that it's actually applicable um, in this section, which is the first section of Division Three, um, you'll see that when it, it's applicable, if it's a major or minor project, um, and so that's just important to see that uh, while public facilities is listed there, that just is a component of stating that that's a criterion to be considered under a major project. Minor projects, oops, not that button, um, you'll see don't include that um, language in there. Um, further, in Chapter 14.34 in the Public Facility section, uh, which was the topic of the discussion more specifically at the previous meeting, um, you'll have a statement there when, where it says when standards apply. Um, again, it's related to land division, site design review, uh, other conditions through higher level land use applications first before it's filtered down. Um, the reason that this is significant when having this kind of discussion is there's lots of sections in the code like tree conservation or landscaping requirements or things like that, that if you just pick that one statement out of the code, yes, it looks like somebody's either right or, or wrong, I guess, if you will, or it's needed or not needed. Um, but it only applies if it rises to the level of that major or minor project first in order to then move down through the code uh, as is required. <clears throat> so again, just with the utilities, just to really uh, put a bow on this, um, this section of code, um, as I believe might've been stated during the last meeting, um, but if not is, intended for new subdivisions such as the Sunrise Ridge subdivision or even some of our older subdivisions the Greenbridge subdivision out South 6th Street um, things like that you'll notice down there 
everything's underground. Um, when those applications came in for planned unit development, um, one of the conditions is all utilities shall be undergrounded based on this particular criterion right here. It says it has to be done that way. Uh, that, you know, it's, it's our carrot uh, and stick, I guess, if you will. Um, we did briefly kind of get into a little back and forth about amending the code. Um, just want to say development code text amendments can be, uh, they should be, you know, uh, considered uh, for what they might change and how they affect things. Uh, the process with the state of Oregon is a 35 day notice to the state uh, where you provide the proposed changes to them. And then there's a planning commission public hearing and, and recommendation to council. And then another public hearing before the council, uh, again, where uh, more input can be had. Um, so it's just an important thing there remembering that this is much different than say the nuisance code chapter 8.12 um, going forward. Um, so all of that said, I'll pass it over to Jake, but it, uh, at this point, it's the, what we are looking to do is have you all discuss um, knowing that the development code wants to have new development go underground. How does that play with um, franchise agreements going forward, right? As a, as a point of negotiation. Good evening, Mayor and Council. So on the franchise agreement side of things, with each um, utility that comes into town, we end up with a franchise agreement, which is a, a form of contract that lays out what they can do, how they can do it, and what we agree to do you know, along with that. So in the case of undergrounding in particular. Um, we've gone back and looked at a number of pre-existing uh, franchise agreements, some of which are pretty old. And in all of our existing franchise agreements, they, ref or virtually all of them, they, they don't include words like shall and will when it comes to undergrounding in general. Um, they do include it for you know new uh, developments and things just like in the development code. But they often include language like um, the franchisee is strongly encouraged to underground their stuff. And often, it obviously, underground their stuff is not the exact wording. Um, I'm paraphrasing somewhat. But they, um, there are also a number of them that have requirements that say things like when um, you know, the poles that you're using do go underground. So if you're using Pacific Power's poles, when Pacific Power goes underground in that section, you agree that you're going with them. Um, but we do not have pre-existing wording in franchise agreements that says you have to put all your stuff underground. That said, we have been requiring people for a number of years to go underground um, based on a city policy level that has been, and I think, I believe of all of you there, I think Councilor Flex has been on the council longest, and I believe that's been the case at least as long as you've been on the council, is that correct? Which is some time ago. Um, so if you, uh, you as the council wanted to change how we do um, underground requirements for new franchisees, you don't have to go through that whole process of trying to mess with the development code. Um, we can do that as a matter of policy where you all would just say, you know, we want everything to go underground. We want some stuff to go underground, um, things like that. The, the development code would still require it for new subdivisions and that sort of thing. But you all could effectively just tell us what you want done with undergrounding without going through a, a massive process like that. As of yet, our attorney has not thrown anything at my head, so I think I'm doing okay on this. Um, I have asked her to please do so if I go astray. Um, so I guess the long and the short of it is, as we stand right now, any new development, not just new overhead lines, but you know, a new subdivision, a new, um, you know, you've got a lot you want to build a house in it, anything, anything that would go to that uh, development code section, that has to go underground but places where there's existing stuff, like if you wanted to run something new, um, 
you know, in the Northwest neighborhood or, you know, any other place where we've already got existing overhead lines, um, then that could be allowed by y'all. Councillor Urban. Well, certainly, thank you for bringing us more of this information in context. Helpful. Um, a couple of thoughts are coming up in this. Um, and so maybe I'll start with, I feel like we're balancing really three things. Ideally, we want to spur up competition to drive service up and prices down. Um, we want to affect resilience in our all of our utilities services. Uh, we want to avoid blowback um, in in however we do that in terms of fairness from existing uh, agreements. I think those were the all the concerns I took away from um, from this. So this new information, if I'm understanding it properly, uh, what you've communicated, uh, Mr. Boone is. We have this building code where there are requirements for undergrounding um, and that's been in place presumably before almost any of the existing franchise agreements were written and so all so these franchise agreements did get written and these these uh, companies got to come in and and run their services under that existing building code and and it was aerial uh, in the in the build out, and that it's just been a policy communicated by the city uh, that says that's and so we don't understand exactly how consistent that's been or if it's been I don't know if there's documentation on that, but this says hey if you're if a new a new carrier is coming in at some point, they would potentially have to be undergrounding. Is that probably why Zipley came to us and said, uh, presumably a policy was communicated hey, if you're going to come in the franchise agreement is going to say that you have to underground and they're saying wait a second these other companies didn't have to do that um and so that's probably why we're that that we is are. almost exactly the conversation that we had okay um yeah so now our task is to is to say okay is this how we want it to continue to go um do we since we wouldn't have to change the building code, presumably we could grant the same uh, low barrier to entry that the charter and all these other uh, communication services were granted. And so that would presumably be the fairness uh, aspect of this, that they would be getting the same treatment, but it doesn't check the resilience box that we all desire and that the code was initially put into place for. And I think that's probably where this grant funding, because this is a, what, 10 times the build out costs um, to go underground than an aerial uh, for new construction. So my, my mind's going to, hey, direct, either direct staff, or I don't know how, uh, if it's the utilities that would apply for, you know, these, the build grant or the um, energy efficiency conservation block grant uh, to, and then coordinate that everybody goes underground. Um, because it sounds like everyone's been told that at some point that's going to have to happen. And then when it does happen, everybody has to do it together and everybody has some sort of an agreement that says, yeah, when we do that, we'll, we'll do that. Uh, so maybe we need to, you know, light a fire under that process and, and set that as a goal and say, okay, we're going to try to do that as a community and we're going to go after grants to do that. Um, but I don't see any harm in the meantime, or it's kind of almost a separate issue, it seems like to to check the competition box by allowing another uh, vendor come in. So those are thoughts I've written out. Councilor Stennett. Thank you. Um, did, did I hear someone say that there are in the, the existing franchise agreements agreements to to go underground at, <clears throat> as a group in essence as you? Yes. Um, when the Effectively, whoever owns the pole, which in our case is generally the the electrical utilities, because we got a couple of different electrical uh, electrical utilities in town, depending on where you are. Um, when that utility takes their stuff underground, everybody else who's using their poles, I think everybody, I think we've got it in all the franchise agreements, they all have to go with uh, 
with them. If there are franchise agreements where that isn't there, then next time we re-up the franchise agreement, um, our intention would be to add that language also. So that way when, let's say Pacific Power takes, um, you know, on your street, wherever you live, Pacific Power has a bunch of lines there and they take it underground. We want all of the other things that are on those poles, you know, the phone line, the cable, internet, all of that to go underground with it. And, and we discussed grant funding for this? I, I don't recall. We discussed what? Grant funding to, to um, do this as a... Councillor Savage sent a message this morning. Um, she, I see. It, yeah, and I have not had any... Would that be a municipality uh, applying for the grant to do that? Would that um, be what? Would that be a, the municipality applying for the grant to do that? I have not had a chance to research it at all, okay. so I have no idea. Unless, do you know anything there? Okay. We don't know yet. We just got that information this morning and haven't had a chance to investigate. Thank you. Councillor Flack. Thank you. So uh, I apologize for missing our last meeting. Um, and I did try to listen to this section online and uh, there's a very good reason for these microphones because I'll be honest, before uh, the, and I'm hoping these are a huge improvement. There are big sections I couldn't hear. So I'm going to kind of go by, and it sounded like a great conversation. And I think, um, you know, Councilor Irvin really highlighted, I think, the areas. I think visibility would be one of the other pieces of that as well. Um, and, and it's funny because as uh, Mr. Boone has stated for years, it's always been, nope, they will put them underground. And so my first... Uh, thought when I heard this was, oh my gosh, we can't do that. But as I started thinking through it and listening to some of the conversation, um, yes, the cable company existed long before our rules to underground and were able to put them, uh, their lines on the poles, um, uh, which is interesting. In fact, just as a, a point of interest, they were a monopoly at that point. And back then we used to tell them when they could raise rates or not. Um, but then, um, you know, satellite, uh, TV came in, and of course, then they were a monopoly, and we couldn't do that anymore, so that's an aside. Yes, I am an old fart. I've been here a while. So, um, but it, kind of interesting, I, uh, I, I really have, you know, concern. I know that Charter, when they purchased um, uh, the cable company, uh, the city had to get after them quite a bit to get them to follow those rules. Uh, they were putting in over the line stuff that clearly did not exist. And so they needed to have their hand held for a while. Um, that being said, when we bought our house um, almost seven years ago, it looked like there had been cable, but there was not a line. And so they actually undergrounded going to my house. So um, I think it's well established that it is what they should do. Um, so I guess at this point, I'm open to allowing that competition as long as we don't backslide, you know, to where we're actually putting in uh, over over the wire cable where it doesn't already exist. Um, that would be kind of where I'm at. I love the idea of competition. Um, Charter is certainly not competitive in their, in, in their uh, internet rates and uh, they're hands down better than our um, CenturyLink. So I do think competition is needed um, so I certainly think that there is room for us to to uh, move on this one, but I'll be honest, I'm not sure exactly where I want that line in the sand to be drawn. Councilor Stennett. Thank you. Um, Councilor Irvin, not to single you out, but you mentioned it doesn't tick, tick the resiliency box. Um, if we do let people continue to, to, to go over ground, uh, above ground, did, you, did I paraphrase that? correctly or I'm not even sure I heard that part right I the resiliency box for me was it you get greater resiliency undergrounding right and you said it doesn't tick that box to let them go above ground obviously are, are you okay with that and it's not me singling you out I just think it's part of the discussion to decide if we're okay with that or not. yeah allowing yeah I have it in a different category of what would check that box it would be going after the grant funding to get everyone underground I don't think we're going to get Zipply to do that or any of the other ones independently. And I don't know what the motivations would be for Pacific Power necessarily to do it either. So it looks like the only way we really get that resiliency, the way that the code is intended and what we want overall and the quality of life visibility would be to do a mass sweep of a funding to, to say, okay, we're going to require this in here 
is a grant that we can help pass on to, to make this happen. It seems like it would be a different mechanism. So yes, we don't get to check it by saying, Zipply, you can come in and, and, and take care of this. We check the competition box and then we're gonna have to address the resiliency and quality of life one separately. Mr. Stewart. Thank you. I just wanted to share a little bit of information on the public works side. So you might uh, remember the 4th Street project, the Safe Routes to Schools. So we made a conscious effort to um, vary as many of the lines that we possibly could. So we put in conduits at the city's cost because uh, the utilities uh, didn't feel like they, they were uh, under their agreements that they had to do that. So the city, uh, it was grant spurred, but the city paid for to put all the conduits in and to pay for those uh, line adjustments. Uh, there are still, um, I think, I'm not sure which cable company, but there still are um, um, some cable TV lines. We put in the conduits, but we couldn't force them to use them. So um, anyway, I wanted to share that um, when we do a project, we're trying to accommodate that. So the EDA Bohemia Park project, we're looking at, um, and it will be part of the grant cost to underline um, two or three of the sections of, of um, overhead lines that are in that front portion. And then we're also looking at um, preparing to work with uh, Pacific Power to put some um, conduits in Main Street that if at some point we can find the resources to move the aerial lines that are in the alleyways into the main street. So wanted to share on public works side, we're trying to do our part of it, but um, there's no mechanism to force uh, in the current franchise agreements that exist to force them to, to do that when we do the project. So we bear the costs when we do that. I know one of the um, concerns that we talked about was with the ice storm was the weight of the lines do you see anything from Public Works that you could give us advice on that, or do you see that as a concern? Well, um, Mayor, I, I would say a lot of it was from what I heard from other um, entities and probably witnessed here. Um, the power company does a, a decent job trying to um, trim the trees that get too close to their electrified lines. Um, the uh, at least what was said to us, um, both Mr. Sauerwein and myself at the emergency, is that those lower branches, when they catch and uh, fall and they catch the uh, the lower lines, usually the um, internet or the um, the telephone lines, they tend to uh, cause the entire infrastructure to fall down. So um, one of the things that we've done is during this cleanup is we've cleaned up and brought all the trees within um, city tolerances. So we've consciously tried to trim those trees so that if we see another event in the near future that hopefully we won't have as many lines and stuff go down. Um, so it's really about the, the tree maintenance and you know I really can't speak to whether or not there's overloading or um, of that of the existing poles that we would need a utility professional to address that. Do we see any value um, as council to limit the amount of carriers that can come into the city at some point? Right. Councilor Stennett. Is that something we could do? L limit competition to? My first experience with this. <laughs> Um, I, I, I don't think you want an answer to that right now. Um, no. and so I'm just going to say that's a really great question. And, um, if you were to want to go down that road, it would take a lot of analysis. It just doesn't seem like it. And I'm not saying I want to, I'm just asking, mm -hmm. um, you know, free country and all. Mm -hmm. Right. Councillor Flack. Thank you. Um, yeah, I would say that I think it would be prudent to put in this franchise agreement that if a you know, conduit in the future appears, that they are to put their 
uh, infrastructure into them, that actually really rubs me the wrong way that um, a provider may not have done that. And then as those franchise agreements renew, um, that certainly is something that we should be putting in them. You know, they're not paying for it other than running the line through there and reconnecting. So, you know, if the lion share is covered, they should be accommodating. Councilor Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I don't, I don't feel like I know enough about this issue to understand the unintended consequences. I'm concerned. I don't want to be short-sighted in making some sort of overarching change. In particular, if you zoom out and think, well, what's the state's, the state is getting broadband funding. What is their plan? And how does that affect rural communities like us? Is there going to be funding available for more internet service? And does that include going underground? Um, I'm very concerned about resilience, especially after the ice storm, which might help leverage future grant applications because you can see from that incident the benefit cost analysis is probably going to look really great to underground given how expensive it is but how costly it's been to recover but even if you get grants like that it will take many many years um, so i just don't feel like we have enough information to to really go about changing what's been an existing policy or even analyzing the existing policy and the implications. So um, to some extent, while it is very helpful for staff to get a general policy direction from this body for future, for this and future franchise agreement negotiations, it is also a case by case basis, right? Each one is going to be negotiated. Each one is gonna be brought back to you to say, is this, did we hit the mark? Is this where you wanted to fall between requiring undergrounding under any and all circumstances versus never requiring it? And my, my understanding from hearing this, and I'm sure staff is of the same mind, is you're somewhere in the middle and you wanna incorporate the terms that have been included in prior franchise agreements with maybe a little bit more um, emphasis on it to the extent there's funding available, to the extent city is putting the conduit in, um, you're going to take any overheaded facilities underground. And um, I just want to be really clear, I'm not helping staff uh, negotiate this. I'm Ar Armand Resto Spots is our franchise guy, and so he will be working with staff to continue crafting the language. It's pretty much done actually there is a franchise agreement it, i think there's two areas this and another piece um, that they're going to finalize and it'll all come back to you so you have a chance to look at it to see is this right and then once that's crafted that could be carried forward um at least proposed in future franchise agreements councillor senate thank you um do i understand correctly that the the ordinance that requires new development to go underground is is quite old. It predates. I mean, uh, Mayor Councilor Stennett, yes, um, the undergrounding ordinance, um, I believe, is original. First shows up in the late seventies. Okay. In the code, currently, right now, if you look at the code book itself, it'll say two thousand seven, but that's just one of the most that's when the model code, development code that we're operating under was adopted by council. Um, but historically, it does go back into the 70s. So when you look at subdivisions like uh, Councilor Flex, which is that era, that's why it's all underground up there. So the the notion that we need to require this is pretty is pretty old. It's it's not a new a new thing. Um, do we know if there was any? A study or any expertise at the time, I would just love to have some object objective expertise if someone comes in and looks up and says, wow, that's dangerous. That needs to go underground. Um, I think we got a pretty good look at that in, you know, a, a couple of months ago, but I was, is, do we need to to be putting everything underground from now on? I, I, it'd be nice to know. I would offer that there are standards that any provider on a pole has to meet, such as you know, clearances from the ground and things like that. So if a pole is undersized, it's too short of a pole and adding another service to it would make that line be below tolerances. 
they either have to swap out the pole for a taller pole or they'll take another route. Um, they're, they are managed by, um, I don't know if it's under AASHTO or one of the other um, entities that, you know, ensures that power lines aren't just at six feet up off the ground, right? It, that would kind of defeat the purpose. Um, and so there are standards for separation that exist that they have to follow per their use agreements for the poles as well. And so uh, when they're building their models and building the network here locally, they're looking at all those things. How high is our, you know, hang point on a pole? Um, and with slack between poles, is that going to meet the minimum standard and things like that? So, um, and also from, I mean, just an economics end of things, there's no business benefit to creating a hazard. Well, I, I can say on my part, um, as, as long as it's safe and we're making sure that we trim our trees, I support more competition, smaller government control. So I would support that. Right. Councilor Irvin. Just back to Councillor Dreer's point, I I don't know if we're hearing the same thing, but this this does what we're talking about right now wouldn't uh, be a policy change per se, would it? Other than potentially adding a you know if there's an existing conduit that you have to go into it. Um, but I am maybe we'll talk after or something. But I am interested to incorporate what that would mean because there is a lot of conversation going on you know, childcare, rural internet seem to be the hot topics of, uh, for the regions of uh, what you might see as a potential issue there. If it's like, hey, we do this and then, and then funding comes out later, like we have in another instance, or is it like a different uh, concern? Just wanted to hear more about the Thank you, Mayor, Councilor Irvin. I, I, what I'm hearing is a chain. We're not really proposing a change in our standard operations, and certainly I want to promote competition and better service, lower prices for people. That is going to really affect people's pocketbooks and their experience of living here. I'm just curious how this plays into the larger, the larger uh, context of what what is the state doing. Um, I don't, I don't know what kind of funding there could be out there for undergrounding things. I have heard of utilities applying for hazard pre-hazard mitigation funds to underground um, their utilities, in particular where there's they're the only utility and it's one way in, and if it goes out, an entire community is islanded and and cut off. Um, so I don't know. I would be interested to hear more about how how do we play regionally and what. I think that it is affected by what our speeds are, what our internet speed currently is in this community as to whether you even get priority for any federal funding. If if you're like just fast enough, it's like, oh, you're fine. Don't worry about you. All right. So we have direction. All right. Mr. If I could just clarify. So what I think I'm hearing is you are liking the idea of making sure things stay underground where things are already underground, not putting up new poles, you know, for example, in Sunrise Ridge, other places where it's already underground. So you're okay with requiring people to go underground there. Um, and if it's already got poles and overhead stuff, you're okay with new stuff going on the overhead? Yes, please do. Um, if it would otherwise be permitted by the code, yes. right? I mean, because there's going to be situations where your code, it is a development code issue, and it does have to go underground, no question. Mm -hmm. So it, it is, we're only talking about situations not covered by the development code, and what do you want to have happen there? Okay, thanks. Councillor Flack. Oh. And I'm sorry, I just remember from watching it, there was one piece that was inaccurate from that comment. Um, the Zipley person had talked, there was talk about our own wireless network and that, oh, this was just a municipal, you know, government and school. Uh, we in fact did 
cell internet for, for a time under that. And I guess I would want to make sure nothing precludes us from doing that. Uh, you know, Independence Monmouth actually ran fiber to everybody's home. Right. And so I would hate to see a franchise agreement ever preclude us from doing something like that. And this franchise agreement does not preclude us from doing that. Okay. Okay. And finally, um, Councillor Fleck mentioned, uh, I think it was Councillor Fleck, if conduit appears in the future, they got to put the conduit in there. Is that something else you yeah. want? Yes. In there? Is that mm -hmm. okay? I'm seeing heads nod. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Yeah, not 20 years later. Yes. Councillor Senator. Would that include, um, thank you, um, you know, a, a, con a concerted effort by all the utilities to go in? Can, can we keep that in? Uh, as oh, the, with other franchise agreements, the, if everybody goes, about, if everybody goes underground, you go too. Yeah, yeah, that okay. that's already okay. Thank you. Tubes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Item E: Winter Storm Update Staff Report by Public Works and Development Director Mr. Stewart. Thank you, Mayor, and good evening, Council. Um, before you, hopefully, I placed a. Um, a memo from myself on kind of the highlights of where we're at so far in this 2024 ice storm cleanup. So uh, just some fun facts here for um, as of uh, today, there's been uh, 749 loads of brush, dump truck loads of brush uh, removed and taken to Mount Brushmar. Uh, there's been 540 loads of chips uh, that have been chipped by the various different companies. Uh, all the tree trimming and safety hazards on city streets and right-of-ways have been removed, excluding the alleys, and hopefully those alleys will be completed this week. Um, Middlefield Golf Course is approximately 80% cleaned up. And the drop site at Bohemia Park is continuing to see, uh, receive woody debris. Lane Forest Products is high stacking the brush and chipping. They, that's an error. Uh, after this week, they'll have seven days of chipping, but so far they've chipped five days. And then each time they're each day that they're able to chip, they um, they chip uh, 12 uh, chip band loads uh, of chips. Um, for the most part, half of them are delivered to the um, market, and the other half are taken out to the R uh, R Street there at the industrial park south of town and are stockpiled. So if you Drive down that way, you can see a large pile of chips. Um, the drop site at, at the Rau River uh, water treatment plant has been cleaned up and remains closed uh, to dropping additional debris. Uh, the self serve chip and firewood sites have been established at the Rau River water treatment plant and presently at the Middlefield Golf Course parking lot. So, folks looking for firewood, the best place to go right now, presently, is at the golf course parking lot. And chips, the best place to go is at the, the Rau River Water Treatment Plant. Uh, we'll continue to do our best to keep the chip bin full, and we'll also uh, bring the firewood rounds. Uh, hopefully, by the end of next week, all the firewood that we have manufactured will be um, at the Rau River Water Treatment Plant that hasn't been picked up. And I will say that we have a steady flow of people uh, taking advantage of the firewood um, this weekend. Well, yeah, Saturday, uh, it was nonstop um, pickups coming and picking up firewood at the Middlefield Golf Course. So expenses to date, I'm glad you're all sitting down. This is uh, rather staggering in some respects, but uh, to date, city staff from um, the uh, January 13th uh, through February 29th, there has been 4,142 0.75 hours of staff time logged at a cost of just shy of $120,000. Uh, the total value of the city equipment used uh, to date is $217,000. And then uh, the big number here are contracted expenses that's through today um, is uh, $1,584,690.50. That's a big number. Um, and then five crews have completed th their work and have been um, uh, relieved of helping us here at the city. We still have seven employed and hopefully by the end of this week, um, Mr. Centers, who's been overseeing the 
management of those crews and I will get together and see if um, we still need any um, crews to help us in the future. We may need one or two to continue a few other, other items. So the remaining debris cleanup sites um, at the golf course, we have a, um, a few trees to address along holes 7, 14, and 15. And hopefully uh, it's our intent to have that completed this week. Um, to, we still need to haul off uh, firewood, brush, and chips. The majority of that should be uh, removed by uh, this Friday, weather permitting at the golf course. And then uh, stump grinding will probably, some of it's already began, the ones that are in the uh, course of the play of the course play, um, the ones that are outside of course play will probably get ground throughout the summer as we have staff time to deploy. Uh, the carp paths uh, hopefully will start uh, being shaped up at the end of this week and next week. And um, damaged trees and down limbs along former driving, the driving range will be trimmed and cleaned up uh, starting this week. That might take a couple weeks to get that completed. Uh, the Rau River Trail uh, cleanup of the down trees on the BLM portion of the uh, trail um, up to the Drina Lake Dam has started and we hope that we believe it'll be completed this week. East Regional uh, Park, we have a crew out there uh, taking down the hanging limbs and do it, chipping the debris. Once again, we believe that'll be done this week. Riverside Park, we have three tree removals yet to do and some hanging limbs in the fir trees, those will have to be climbed. Um, the alleyways, as I said, we uh, we actually got reminded this week, this last week that those needed to be done. So uh, we believe we can get those taken care of. The alleys, uh, the ones that I'm talking about are in the Northwest neighborhood and there's a couple, two or three alleys over by Corner Park area. The stump grinding, there's 80 trees in the uh, park strips. Uh, we will work on those throughout the summer with the intent on trying to order trees and replant trees this uh, fall and winter to get the, the trees back in the park strips. And then uh, city staff, their disc golf city staff will take care of um, the down trees and the, the, um, the limbs and stuff uh, throughout the, uh, the next month. Uh, we're intending on March 25th in closing the uh, drop site uh, for debris at Bohemia Park um, and Lane Forest will continue to grind that. Um, like I said, they've been five days. They, they're making a dent, but there is still a lot of chip or debris to chip. Uh, I'm guessing that uh, if we are able to accommodate when the market can receive chips, that it'll probably take the month of April before that gets completely ground up which would be fine uh, because I don't believe the um, Grand Fondo starts. That would be, I think, our first special use permit approval for that parking lot as uh, June 1st, I think. Um, city staff has been delivering wood chips um, in the city and surrounding areas. Uh, we're very thankful that folks are taking those chips because there's no market for them and uh, folks are, are utilizing them. So that's been a plus. Um, once again, the firewood uh, seems to be going well. Um, branch pickup, so our usual annual limb and, and branch pickup is in May, but um, we will be doing one um, on the 13th and 14th of this week. And then we'll do a final uh, branch and limb pickup on uh, March 25th and 26th. And uh, tentatively, the golf course, uh, fingers crossed, we are shooting to reopen the golf course on March 22nd. And then um, in regards to FEMA and the, um, which is the Federal Emergency Management um, Department and the Oregon Office of Emergency Management. We're working with both uh, those entities. They've set up a, um, a drop site, when I say drop site, um, a computer portal to download all of our um, debris information and everything that they need. Um, Ms. Nye's been doing a great job in getting, flooding them with thousands of pictures and, and all the necessary documents. So on our end, we're trying to um, uh, get everything into them 
so that they can, they're going through their phase two, which is they're gonna, they're assessing the damage, the amount, um, and putting together the case for the federal government to declare an emergency. Um, I did uh, reach out to uh, Congresswoman Hoyle's office and, and received an email back from um, Mr. Whalen, uh, her staff here in Eugene, and he said that they are strongly believe that the federal government will declare an emergency, make a, a declaration, which will then allow us to receive 75 to 100 percent of our um, expenses to be reimbursed. Um, he he said 75 percent obviously is the lower end of the threshold. He wasn't overly confident, but they will do everything they can to try to um, make the case for 100 percent reimbursement. So. Um, as the expenses uh, continue to roll up, we're probably going to be close to 2.5 million. Um, and if we can get 75% of that reimbursed, that would be great. So 100 would be better, but um, at least 75 would would um, would help soften the blow to our reserve funds. And then lastly, uh, I'll be presenting to the Lane Preparedness Coalition this Thursday their entire membership. Um, and I've been asked to be one of four presenters of the impacts to our community. Um, so we're sp spreading what we, um, the information of what we dealt with and then talk about uh, some of the things that we could do to uh, be better prepared and, and what it, and lessons learned. So it, it's, um, it's a good opportunity for all of us to uh, learn from the events and, and there'll be uh, opportunities to learn for ways we can be better prepared um, as a group. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Any questions? Councilor Mary Day. Thank you, Mayor. Um, can these dates be shared with the public for the, the uh, latest limb pickups and uh, when the drop site is being closed? Um, Mayor, are, we, Council, are we free to share these? Councilman Mayor Day, um, I turned in a Friday update for the dates that um, when it's going to close, when the debris uh, site's going to close, and also the last pickup, I was not able to get it into uh, last Friday update, but we'll try to get it out on Facebook um, this tomorrow and try to get as much uh, information out there. We also ordered two banners. I've, um, ordered two 20 foot long banners so that we can put the debris drop off site is closing on March 25th. So folks can see that too. Um, and just try to get that information out the best we can. But we're free to share it as well. Yes, you're free. Thank you. And then about wood chip deliveries. Are you still recruiting potential uh, folks that want wood chips? Oh yes. Yeah. We got um, several, uh, probably a thousand, yards of chips right now ready to go if we can find a place for them. So that can also be shared out and make, you're the, still the contact person for chip yeah. chip orders. Yeah, they <laughs> call the public works office uh, or send myself an email. Uh, we'll get, get it scheduled. All right, thank you so much. Yep. Councilor Dreher. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Stewart, for this detailed report. What are the factors that affect FEMA's decision whether to reimburse us 75 or 100 percent of our costs? Um, Mayor, Councilor Dreher, I, I'm not 100 percent sure. I think it's, as it was pointed out to me in the email, um, former representative um, Mr. DeFazio was very strong and, and uh, was in a position where he was able to make a really strong case for that. Um, I would hope that um, Ms. Hoyle will be able to uh, uh, represent our, um, our need, which I'm sure she's very capable of. Um, I, I don't know other than maybe your tenure and, and uh, how, how strong your voice is back in Congress is to, to make the, the case, but uh, um, I think also it could be the um, amount of other disasters around and how much money the federal government has to, they feel that they can give out to. Councillor Stennett. Thank you. Um, 
it, it stands to reason we'd be cautiously optimistic about that happening. Reimbursement from the state and federal sources. Are we? Is it bad luck at this point to talk about if if they don't? What we would do? <laughs> so, Mayor and uh, Councilor Stinnett, um, myself, and uh, our finance director have. Uh, Ms. Likens have gone back and forth quite a bit about what what ifs, and uh, it appears she's trying to scour the um, statutes that uh, govern our uh, expenditures. Uh, probably, uh, worst case scenario is is that we would have to uh, the reserve funds that we're using. We would make a loan to the. Uh, areas like the general fund and the street fund and the, the parks um, and wastewater uh, from that reserve fund and then those um, entities would be charged with repaying that reserve fund over time. That's the the worst case scenario and maybe the most most realistic one I think that um, Ms. Likens has found. Um, Hopefully we can make the case that um, we'll receive that 75 to 100% and we can uh, repay the, the reserve fund quicker and, and put it behind us. That's my understanding. We're gonna have to probably do that anyway, right? Because we're not gonna receive those funds no matter what this fiscal year and then yep. repay it back. Correct. And Mayor, I don't think that they're, they're thinking that the declaration for the disaster is gonna be in April and then there's going to, um, once the declaration has been made, then the uh, Congress will have to appropriate some resources. That most likely probably won't happen in this fiscal year. Thank you. Mr. Boone. On just a tangentially related note, I would just like to express my own appreciation for whoever came up with the name Mount Rushmore, because that's awesome. Okay. Thank you. All right, item F, fiscal 2023-24 mid-year eight-month financial grade report presentation, Ms. Likens. I apologize, Mayor and Council, for my voice this evening. I woke up this way, so I'm sorry. I know it's difficult to understand what I'm saying. Um, so the end of our calendar year is the halfway point for our fiscal year of July through June, and the, the green light, red light, financial report that you have in front of you goes through March 1 and it also includes expenditures for the January ice storm that we were just speaking of. Um, it consists of revenues and expenditures compared to the, our budget and it, if all things were equal we would expect that to see 33% of the budget remaining and 67% of our revenue received but as you know all things are not equal and we will have paid say an insurance bill July 1 100% spent or there'll be no more spent um, and perhaps there's some franchise fees that you only get quarterly so you won't see that 67% in there so it's a balancing um, act. Um, the traffic light indicating the grade scale is in each of the different funds and all funds are uh, meeting or exceeding our expectations except for two uh, which are the general fund which is under supervision and the industrial park fund, which is unsatisfactory. Uh, in the general fund, operating revenue is on track or exceeding budgeted projections and is at 86% received. Uh, Non-operating revenue, specifically our carryover, is at 65% of the budgeted amount uh, expected to start with the fiscal year. So expenditures are being monitored and the direction from our city manager to staff has been to limit purchases to those which are absolutely necessary for the balance of this fiscal year. Um, transfers to other funds will also be uh, reviewed to determine what level, the lowest level, that we can transfer appropriations to meet our expenditures. Uh, the industrial park is anticipating additional revenue from the sale of property. Um, the sale of the property is actively being uh, pursued, and if the property is not sold, an interfund loan will be necessary to pay the debt. Uh, the fund is being closely monitored. And I think that we may have some um, potential buyers. So um, that's very helpful if that comes to fruition. In addition, uh, costs for the debris cleanup, you'll see in this report in the specific departments that I have highlighted that 
with yellow, so you can see where those expenditures are and that the percentages are high as far as our expected um, percentages are in each of those funds. Um, so we are very hopeful that FEMA does take action and, and reimburses us. It, the 75% to the 100% level would be the best. Um, it's staff's recommendation that the council reviews the report and asks for clarification as needed. Any questions? Thank you. You're welcome. Item G, Council Rules Review, Staff Report by City Manager, Mr. Sauerwein. Well, good evening, Your Honor, members of the Council. Uh, we have two items under this tonight. Uh, first, we'll be asking the uh, City Attorney uh, to complete reviewing the uh, rules with the Council. And then, if the Council so wishes, uh, we have provided you with a uh, resolution for adoption. Good evening. Thanks. Fun to have two things to talk with you guys about tonight. Um, so you have before you um, a resolution. Let's not talk about that right now. Let's just look at the rules that are attached. The, there's a redlined version. So what I did, I went through, I took out all the comments that sort of had explained discussion to date, and I accepted the changes that this body had said, yep, that looks good. And then this group had also said, Carrie, what we want in addition or instead is this language or you know give it a try and so let's just look really quickly at um section 2.2 the the request that i understood was that yes you wanted limits on the agenda sessions um but you wanted the same ability um, as with regular meetings to extend times in 30 minute increments either by a majority of the council or the presiding officer. If, if, okay, great. I'm just gonna, if, if anybody disagrees, yes. And I am no, I, I apologize, no, Madam Mayor, I'm gonna just respond to try no, to keep the conversation please. going. Okay, Councilor Irvin. So maybe at the end of the first sentence that it, the word meeting was missing. I'm so sorry. What? What section are you looking at? To the council may council hold meeting. agenda session meetings after council member packet review and prior to a regular. Oh, oh <laughs> yes, look at that. Very good. It's probably been like that for a while. And then the 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 highlighted red line looks looks acceptable great keep yes please call out any edits that you saw through any of the sections whether we're talking about them or not councillor Stennett. um the part where it says are for council questions only is that new i mean i know we talked about uh, making sure that the agenda sessions are largely to get our questions answered but you know what i can compare i have that your current rules here i don't remember actually because um i know that it is they are limited. Da, 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 da. So 2.2, there what it currently says is agenda sessions are for council discussion and review only. No public input will be accepted, and the council should not vote or make any commitment regarding future votes. So we've made a change from discussion and review to questions only. Am I seeing that? Yes. In order to take that discussion piece out, because what we didn't want was to have positions stated, and instead what we wanted were clarifications asked about upcoming the Monday night's discussion. If somebody needed background in order to inform what they wanted to be able to say on Monday, on this the regular meeting. Thanks. Okay. Uh, in section four, we added the city manager, the mayor, or in the mayor's absence, the council president may cancel cancel a meeting. So that's just clarifying cancellation of a meeting. We added the city manager back in. 7.5, we took out that excusal during the meeting so individuals can get up and depart and come back. 
Um, we all agreed that if there's a permanent departure that will be announced um, and discussed and uh, highlighted for the city recorder in particular, so it makes it into the minutes. 21, I believe, is the next section where I'm seeing a highlighted uh, red line. And um, so for council members addressing the council, what we wanted to do was take out the address piece. And instead, we, we, what it says now is uh, individuals will state their name, whether they are a city resident, and if so, their ward for the record. And then public comment is subject to the limitations established elsewhere. Does that reflect the direction I received? Great. <laughs> Yeah, um, we are on 21 on page eight. Yeah, I, boy, I sure have mixed feelings about this. My address and phone number in the paper, or I mean on the website and they're in the paper. And I guess I have heartburn over, um, we all should be able to stand up for what we believe and, and state that as a resident of this town living at this address. I am not gonna fall on my sword over this. So if consensus is that's the way the council wants to go, I'm okay with that, but um, this is the way it's always been, and I guess I'm just uncertain. In all of the years I've been here, I've never heard of somebody having a retribution taken against them for stating something to this body. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I appreciate that sentiment. There's, I find a couple of key differences now. One, the pro proliferation, <laughs> we have, internet access and, you know, we're not just a central local group that can come in and look at and have interest in what we're doing here. So the risk of uh, retaliation does go up and I think we do see, maybe not here, but a heightened incidence of uh, doxing and different things uh, going on. There's a different type of social warfare that's in effect now than has been in the past will presumably grow um, and we do make a conscious decision to volunteer for this uh, in that capacity repeatedly um, so I do think that we are in a slightly different um, maybe expectation of privacy than maybe a, a citizen and I, I support this in that it it removes a maybe a barrier that isn't necessary for the coming to decisions that we need to. I think having I reside in the city or not really satisfies that. And then if there's follow-up needed for, you know, what specific ward are you in, which, which is great, or if there's a further one that needs to be a follow-up with a public works or something, what street, then that can be handled. But um, I do appreciate that and I wish every, we'd all be more respectful, but it, there's, you know, I think that we're, we're opened up beyond the city of Cottage Grove now, and that, that makes a difference um, as far as people's um, perceived ability to come up and, and actually speak, which we want. I, I support this wording too, because I have actually heard from constituents that they're afraid to speak because they have to say their address, so I would support this. Okay, thank you. Um, 22.1.1, top of page nine. Uh, there was a concern about the prior proposed language um, that would require members of the public to refer to city employees, representatives, and officials by their proper title. And the concern is simply that I, members of the, of the public don't necessarily know everybody sitting up here. Even I stumble to say, titles um, regularly and so I believe Councillor Irvin recommended that we substitute that with uh, the language that the council is the standard the council is held to which is members of the public will accord the utmost courtesy to council members staff and other members of the public um, I I want to just express I I'm not sure that you know say th that's going to be a moving line it's going to be difficult we just need to hope that people are willing to abide by that. And then to the extent that we think somebody isn't being courteous, but they think they're being courteous, you're probably gonna defer and just let them have their three minutes. 
Ms. Thurman. Thank you, Mayor. After having that thought, um, other thoughts came up, which were like, hey, First Amendment. Um, there's been a number of, I watched these audit, auditing videos of First Amendment rights, and one of them was in a court or in a city council meeting where, you know, someone, you know, was using profanity and, and insulting uh, the council members uh, directly and was making the case that this was already proven in, uh, out in the courts that that's except that that's falls under First Amendment expression. So I thought, I'm glad that you're here. I just wanted to kind of pose that, like, does that, does having a policy specifically saying that um, in violation of, you know, what might be, um, you know, proven out in the court that no, the public can say whatever they want. So as long as this is interpreted as not being disruptive to the meeting, this is your business meeting, and if uh, an individual, by not according you courtesy, is disrupting the meeting and stopping other individuals from speaking and interrupting members of the council, you're within your rights to be able to say you're breaching our rules. But if instead they're just using language that somebody finds offensive, um, that's where you would probably defer to going to let them have their three minutes get to limit them to that and we're just going to move on just to follow up because if, if we're saying that they're breaching the they're disrupting the meeting that would logically follow that they could be removed correct and that would all be within you know legal rights of the council to say nope you need to be exited right you usually you would i mean you would give a warning and then if that is um disregarded and the disruptive behavior continues, then the individual can be trespassed for that, the remainder of that meeting. You wouldn't wanna cast a broad net and say you're out for the rest of the year. You know, So there are boundaries in terms of what's allowed by, uh, or what's protected by the First Amendment. Councilor Senate. Thank you. Um, would you think that a refusal to, to uh, conclude your comments within a, the time frame would be, um, a disruption that would warrant a refusal to conclude the time the, yes yes if they continued to speak and like i was saying not letting anybody else have the floor or ignoring the chair um and the, the chair's direction that would i mean arguably you could say it's 22.1.2 right it's use of unreasonably loud disruptive or threatening language but this is just a different way of getting to setting a standard, setting a, um, a civility expectation. And it, it's up to you whether you think it's needed or valuable. Um, there had been previous interest in having a little bit more explanation around what is it that we want in terms of discussions amongst ourselves and with our citizens. Thank you. Okay, we're going to accept 22.1.1. 24.3 is at the bottom of page 10. Um, this is the one that I wasn't 100% sure what was desired. Um, now let's see, I'm sorry. So let's, let's look actually at the intro of 24. And uh, at the beginning of the conversation around section 24, um, I mistakenly stated that section 24 entirely reflected the ethics laws. That is not true. And I corrected myself during the meeting and said, actually, no, it's 24.1 reflects the ethics laws. The rest of it are um, expectations in terms of your conduct, your uh, conduct out in the community, how you represent the council um, and how you separate that from your individual personal views. And so uh, I was asked though to add some language that indicated what's governed by ORS chapter 244 Oregon ethics laws. So I added that reference reflected in part in 24.1 uh, below so that future counselors will now know 24.1 is actually just the law and um, it's repeated here for your benefit and for clarity, but whether it's here or not, you are bound by that standard. 
And then 24.23 um, and the rest of the section is an effort to help counselors stay within their scope of authority and speak clearly when they're speaking on the dais and out in public. And the change we made in 24.3 was, um, it must have gone from must to should. I'm not sure why it isn't showing up in track changes, but the council member should always present the majority position of the council. Personal opinions and comments may be expressed when prefaced with, and we took out that only, just to soften it slightly and provide that guidance rather than you know, something that sounded a little harsher. Um, only when prefaced with the clarification that the statements do not represent the position of the council. Does that hit the mark in terms of what you were looking for in terms of guidance? But okay, great. So uh, similarly, 24.5, we changed that must to should for the same purpose. So the conversation then turns to, do you want section 28 in or not? You have, I know that I provided two versions to you one with section 28 and one without section 28. And we, just to repeat prior conversations, um, including section 28 here, doesn't really change the council's abilities to speak out or investigate existing uh, other council members, individual council members, if a majority of the council chooses to do so. But it does, I think, help just to, uh, for everybody to understand what this body can and can't do to its individual members. And really, I guess the emphasis is on what you can't do. You can't remove a member, but you can question, you can publicly censure um, and investigate. Hopefully before we get to that point that we'll just be talking about it because this is a learning process for everyone. So I guess I just, yeah. Thanks. Well, I think I put up the biggest stink on this one, and so I've had time to think about it and, and you know, wrap more context into it. So I do appreciate you uh, taking the time, and all of you, uh, with that. And the fact that it is expressing an inherent uh, capacity of the council, um, that's and I think the, and the other changes have alleviated the other concerns that kind of prop this up as being more concerning. Um, I'd be happy uh, to leave that in. So once again, I apologize for missing last meeting. Um, back in section 11, if we could jump backwards a little bit, I actually just am rereading this and it does not expressly call out the 30 minutes per item on the agenda for each item. Um, I've expressed real concern in that first meeting, um, uh, we discussed this, there were over four hours of potential public comment time between all of the items on there. And my fear is that um, we have a lot of business to do as a body and that that amount of public comment could um, stymie the public process. And so my preference would be to have the time in the front as it states in, in this, uh, but have it for items on or off the agenda. And if there's interest, I mean, gosh, if a, you know, if a large majority of folks have an interest in one area, we certainly can always have a work session around that and give it the time necessary, but we have, ordinances and resolutions we need to pass. We have a uh, business of the city that needs to happen. And I guess I just worry a little bit um, that we could end up, um, you know, kind of signing what we need to do in an effort to be open and, and, you know, listen to our citizens, which I totally get and totally want to do. I just want it to be in an appropriate venue. So okay. Councillor Fleck, there's uh, section 11 addresses that intro, um, public comment opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, section 14 addresses public comment on action items that may be allowed. And oh. it sets a three minute per person and a 30 minute time limit overall. Oh, thank you. Well, and I guess I would, 
I would want to move this uh, to that 30 minute period in the beginning. This is, you know, like I said, not an effort not to listen to the, the constituents, but in an effort to make sure that we're able to get the business of the body, you know, completed. Councillor Evan. Thanks. Um, so you're, you're suggesting, if I hear you correctly, 30 minutes regardless, on or off the agenda. Yeah, this this would be one that I'm gonna I'm gonna hold on to, um, and it's and and I do want to acknowledge the concerns about what is you know this is a business meeting we're here to conduct business we need to get through the business so but it's also one of the only or one of the most easily accessible uh, access points uh, for a citizen to express their, express their concerns um, and so here we are balancing. Uh, both of those things. My understanding, sorry about the feedback, is that the mechan that as it's written, um, the chair, the the presiding officer could say, "Hey, at in, under these existing rules, this is getting to where we're not going to be able to complete our business in reasonable time, and so we will defer, or we it could stop the." public comment and move and make the decision to move it. it and if that's the case then it would be up to the presiding officer to to say uh, to balance that which is basically their role uh, to make sure that we're able to conduct business um, the thing that i think we lose by moving the item up and i, I mentioned this in i think in our previous time and something i really do feel strongly about is you know if someone coming to their first meeting um hasn't has, hasn't you know, just gets off work learns about it hey there's meetings at seven o'clock you know comes uh and is hearing about an item that affects them or their neighborhood or uh for the first time and the, they're hearing about it uh at the staff presentation and they have something relevant to say and this gets to the do you have to sign up thing even um i want i want to be able to hear those concerns before i make a decision before council engages in, in discussion like the, that's almost like this nugget of what's beautiful about our representative system here um, that I want to preserve. Uh, and so that's why I'm waiting. I want to preserve that so much that I'd be willing to, to put up with a longer potential disruption and, and will the presiding officer always handle it the way I would want it? Maybe not. So that's the risk that, um, that's where I fall on it. I want to preserve that. Uh, Councilor Flack. So I'd love our city attorney to weigh in on this because it basically says we will have 30 minutes per item, uh, up to three minutes per people. So, so it says may. It says so section 14 in the third line, an opportunity for citizen comments may be provided after the staff report and prior to council discussion. The one that says shall is that appearance of interested citizens. Um, up to 30 minutes near the beginning of each regular meeting. So that's the mm -hmm. 10.5. But then any additional public comment after the business items is a uh, permissive. It's, it's a, and I, I like that idea that if it's going late, you now have a two hour cap on your meetings. And so there's gonna be a balancing between, is it important for us to hear, you know, there's more, individuals who want to speak on a particular business item versus we have now just extended the meeting twice. So we are now at, instead of nine, we're at 10. So no, we're, we're, that permissive aspect is going to be triggered. But it is, um, you know, the, the, the balancing act or an item could be tabled. Well, I, I guess just for history's sake, um, basically what we had before this uh, rule was uh, that we had items on the agenda was 30 minutes at the front of the meeting. Items not on the agenda uh, was 30 minutes at the end of the meeting. And there was a lot of concern about people who just wanted to come and give us some input without having to sit through a whole meeting. So we decided to adopt this, you know, current form as, a, as an effort to, you know, have folks that don't understand how city government works and allow them to be able to have an opportunity to speak. Um, I, I think that this has been confusing 
Um, I think most people who come in don't understand how this process works. Um, and I guess I can live with this with a little bit of a language change, and I don't even think it has to be here, but on our agendas where, it, you know, we can have a message that says, if, you know, public comment could run over X period of time or words to that effect, you know, public comment may not be taken and or this item may be put off for a future agenda. I'm okay with that. Like I said, my, my fear is, and, and I think all of us know we've had some really long meetings um, where we're getting out of here at, you know, 10, 10, 30, 11. And, and um, it's just, I'll be honest, it's hard to be effective when you've worked all day and then you've sat in a meeting for four hours to 11 o'clock in the evening. So um, I'm just trying to strike a balance for us. And I think if, if we can get a little tweak, once again, it doesn't even have to be here. Uh, it could just be in our, our actual agendas. I, I could look at that. I support that too. I think that is a good compromise. Um, it's it's really, I echo what Councilor Irvin said. Um, I think it's really important for us to hear, and I think we all agree on that from our constituents, um, but we do have to be mindful of city business for sure. Um, but again, I, I do think that that rarely happens unless we have a real hot button topic that we see the council chambers packed. So I would support that. But I also think that um, now that there's a two hour time limit for council mm -hmm. meetings, that the the agendas that will be coming to you will be um, right. I, I don't, I mean, I'm not trying to step on your toes. <laughs> <laughs> City Manager Sarah Wine, but um, but I'm guessing that you won't have something that is anticipated to be three hours as your final uh, agenda item. Councilor Dare. Thank you, Mayor. I am concerned it is confusing for attendees who come to give public comment, and I think it's great to have public comment right at the beginning so that they can say their piece. That's why they came, and they don't have to sit through the entire meeting. This says if you, if the item's on the agenda, they have to wait until that item on the agenda, instead of being able to say their piece and then leave, which I understand it does make them sit through the staff report and get more information. Um, but I'd rather just hear all the public comment at once and make it less confusing because we have had instances, I think it was more of a public, it was like a public hearing versus public comment where it's really awkward to stop someone and say, oh, actually you're commenting on a different thing. This isn't the time for you to comment on that right now that does not feel good to shut down public comment when they're not doing it at the right time in the meeting. So if we can clarify for the attendees, make it convenient that it's all at once, this is when you do public comment. Just for clarification, we actually did make a change um, where we have two different sign-up sheets, one for the agenda and one for off the agenda. So they actually will not be called on until, so I think that's helpful. Councilor Stenner. Thank you. Okay. I, I think I'd kind of like to see us go back to the old system of 30 minutes for items on and 30 minutes for items off. Um, we've we've um, empowered the presiding officer to make make a call on whether or not the the, um, the the comment in general is going too long and whether we have to take a pretty, what I think is a pretty big step of, of cutting the meeting short or, or tabling something to go to go later on. I would I would rather say 30 minutes for items on the agenda following the, the period for items off and then empower the presiding officer to say, now that we've heard the staff report, does anyone have any comments? Um, that would happen probably rarely, but it would give the opportunity for that to happen. Um, and we could front load comments anyway. We could get people out of here uh, if they choose to. Um, we would, If you want to stay and hear the staff report and learn more, and you think that's going to, uh, to get the juices flowing and get, you know, prompt you to, to, to give another comment, then, then by all means. I, I, seems a good compromise to me too, I don't know. Mr. Stewart. Thank you, Mayor, and maybe this is a question for council, but I know that when we get into public hearings and we have records that we're trying to keep, it's really important that those folks make comments during that period when we're doing the records. So I just wanna make sure that we're not gonna talk about moving people's comments or allowing people to make comments in the very beginning that really pertain to that specific item during the public hearing. Councilor Mary Day, did you have something? Yeah, just in a, a question for the attorney. I thought I remember reading some language about um, you know, comments that are excessively repeating or something. Is that still in there somewhere? 
if we could leave uh, limit comments for you only you agree with this previous speaker or something that might cut down on the amount of comments i think that's in section 12 with regard to the public hearings so it, it i know that it was there and it may have come out after discussion um and then it might just be on the public hearing script. Yeah, I thought that might alleviate uh, Councillor Fleck's concern about things going on too long. It, there, there, it, we're, we have been doing a dance, haven't we? And, and it is um, hard to make sure that people are commenting when it makes sense for them, when they're going to be educated, but when it's convenient for their schedules. So I, I am happy to do whatever you guys tell me. I, I, um, want to get it right. I think personally having it in the script is a good way to do it because that's something that would be difficult to regulate. You know, when somebody's up there speaking, oh, we've already heard from the last speaker, that would be difficult to do, Councillor Irvin. Thank you, I, I would agree. The more, the more that is for each meeting presented and clarifying the better. Um, and I've, uh, wholeheartedly agree with the, the uh, suggestion that Councillor Stone made. If we do 30 minutes up front on all of the items, um, I don't think we brief on and off of the agenda, but also leave it open to receive. So we're not, you know, excluding uh, those kind of last minute things if they are relevant. Um, that's, that's fantastic. And I think that does probably actually get to uh, the limit limiting factor. Um, on those overall on the shoot there was one other piece um, oh the sign we well I don't know if we mentioned this the sign up um, mm -hmm. we got to that yet but making it available that you know if somebody does have something there's been times even when we had that rule I remember that it was obvious that we needed to hear, uh, and so we allowed it. So maybe some language that says, you know, we would encourage a sign up ahead of time. Here's why it helps us understand and order the meetings. Um, please, that's our, you know, primary mode of operating. Uh, but it, we're not going to limit ourselves. We'll we'll be able to uh, make that judgment call as a presiding officer, something to that effect. Uh, put, would be put it in the agenda that at some point, if there's anyone that did not sign up that would like to speak, we could do that if there's time allowed. Okay, so what I'm hearing is that section 11 is going to be changed so that there shall be a period of time first for interested citizens to talk about items not on the agenda for a maximum of 30 minutes, limited to three minutes each. Mm -hmm. And then there's going to be a sub B, which is allowing individuals to speak on items that are on the agenda. Again, that, that all of those cumulative will have a maximum of 30 minutes, three minutes each. And then we will also have under action items that the mayor, after, after the presentation of the staff report, mayor may ask if there's any additional public comments before council deliberation. As time permits. Okay. Um, hang on. And then, uh, and just to get to the sign up, um, 22.21. Um, so 22.2.1 on page nine, where we're going to have the sign up to attend and to speak during appearance of interested citizens, comma, action items, comma, or scheduled hearings. And then you'll have your three different sign ups um, that will be really clear for um, the mayor or, or chair when to call on individuals. Mm -hmm. And just to be really clear, the uh, currently action items does specifically say you wouldn't talk here if it's there's a public hearing that is scheduled or will be scheduled. So hopefully that addresses um, Director Stewart's concerns and I'll carry that over. So I think there's enough changes 
that we should do another round. We shouldn't try to adopt this with the changes as discussed. I would like to get it back in front of you accepting these. Um, I would just then have again in track changes, you know, so everything that's in track changes in front of you will be accepted. This new language will be in track changes, will include the censure language and, um, and have similarly a, an adopting resolution with a final version of the rules, assuming that it, what I propose is acceptable. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All righty. Concerns from council? Councilor Mary Day. Um, tomorrow evening uh, from five to seven at the Accent Fiddle is the monthly history pub. It happens every second Tuesday and this uh, particular Tuesday will be, uh, the title is City Utilities, a, a Source of Constant Complaints. Um, I will be following the development of city utilities from soiled wells all the way to a our current system, not in detail, but a lot of highlights uh, through the through the journey, and you'll get to see some really neat um, pictures of old documents and news stories, and hear uh, the tales of that. Um, even today, when you hear people talk, they were saying that 100 or 120 years ago. So, X and fiddle, five to seven. Anyone else, Councillor Irvin? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the primary thought uh, was just this recurring, or maybe it's recurring thought uh, that we need a public relations officer. We need a we need a presence uh, at the city that really gets information out. Um, and I know that's something that has been on the radar, and uh, so I just wanted to re. We bring that one up, uh, see see the need for it uh, quite often. Uh, and then the other one I did bring up on uh, in the Friday agenda session, and uh, just want to thank you uh, to the chief for uh, reaching out and addressing, but just a general concern uh, about, you know, our, posi our position in the West Coast on I-5, uh, easy access on and off uh, for uh, ab abductions, human trafficking, um, I'd mentioned that I'd had a conversation, uh, now it's been a couple of weeks ago, with a uh, DHS uh, caseworker, and you know, one, in our conversation, she'd mentioned that we have uh, just basically the highest rate of human trafficking going through this area, and it's a serious issue. And then just had a, you know, a scare with my own family, uh, with my children. Um, so I guess I'm looking for uh, information. <laughs> One, an assessment of what is the reality? You know, what are the incidences? Uh, you know, we should, I think we should have a conversation about um, uh, the ability to uh, track people uh, in maybe our, some of our public spaces uh, to be able, to, if there is an incident, uh, to be able to find them. You know, what vehicle did they get into kind of thing? <laughs> of course, balancing uh, close, you know, the. Uh, video cameras everywhere uh, with in privacy with uh, with those kind of concerns is 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 difficult um, but I think we can come together even as a community and you know, what can we do uh, together to be more aware uh, how can we share those resources I know a lot of us have doorbell cameras or something you know uh, getting connected on how do we efficiently uh, communicate with the police now I, I want to uh, applaud our chief uh, for those efforts and uh, in your awareness on that is is, is clear um, and engaging the community uh, goes a long way towards that um, so uh, yeah that one hit hit fairly near and dear uh, to me and uh, just the safety of our community is one of the highest priorities that we have uh, so that's it thanks councillor Flack. Thank you. I almost forgot. Oh my gosh. Super fundraiser is next to a week from tomorrow on Tuesday, the 19th from 5:30 to 7 30 at the Catholic church on 19th behind gasoline alley. Um, if you have not been, the soups there are incredible. 
Um, it's a lot of fun, and I certainly invite anybody to who wants to have some soup. Uh, uh, I'm assuming going to be a cold, wet, you know, uh, spring in or in Cutters Grove. Come out and have some warm soup. Thank you, Councilor Dreher. Thank you, Mayor. I'll also add to that. There's brownies in addition to the soup at the Super Fundraiser next Tuesday. Um, I want to announce that there's a new app called Gov Hub Media, like Gov, like GOV Hub Media. It was put out by Metro TV, which is out of Lane Council of Governments. So it allows the public to stream meetings on their phone or their smart TV. And uh, Metro Television also launched an accompanying public meeting website with links to online streams of other governments that aren't yet on the app. I don't think the city of Cottage Grove is on the app but the the accompanying website has links direct links so it's really easy to find like oh city of cottage grove and all these other cities in our area so the website is govhub g-o-v-h-u-b dot media slash govhub um, so you can watch on the website or the app the app i think is only for if if metro tv already streams your your meeting like um, the city of eugene city council Board of County Commissioners, things like that, um, and other local school districts, other town governments, such as Cottage Grove and Cresswell, as well as the Oregon Legislature's live stream can all be found in that one website. Um, so it's meant to promote transparency and make it easy for people to find where do I see these meetings and what's going on. Anyone else? All right. Um, I want to acknowledge that the Chamber of Commerce had their chamber banquet and their awards banquet, and that was a nice success. And I think everyone had a really great time at that. Um, the next business after hours is going to be at Banner Bank, and that's always a nice venue. So if you can come to that, um, everybody's welcome. And uh, we have a guest back here in um, the back row. If you want to say hello and say who you are. Thanks for joining us. Anyone else? No? All right. Report from the city manager. Well, good evening, Your Honor, members of the city council. Uh, just to follow up on one of the comments that was made by Councilmember Urban. Uh, had a really good meeting with uh, the management team where we were looking at potential positions and changes to the structure of city staff. And one of the priorities that was certainly identified was the need for a, a communications manager. So when we start getting into uh, making the sausage of the uh, budget, uh, that's definitely a conversation that we'll be having is um, you know, why it is that we prioritize that position in the uh, next year's budget. A couple of things I just wanted to follow up on. Uh, we talked about this a little bit on Friday. Uh, wanted to thank uh, Council Member Fleck uh, for giving me a tour of the community sharing program. Uh, it's really amazing to see all of the things that they're able to do uh, out of a, uh, shall we say, a fairly modest facility. Uh, and I, I think it was pretty impressive. Uh, also had a really good meeting with the uh, South Lane School District folks, uh, their early learning center. Uh, was able to spend some time with them and learn all about the projects and priorities that they've been working on. And finally, on a, a personal note, uh, when we started this little journey together, uh, I think we talked about the fact that my wife and I had planned a 30-year anniversary Save the Marriage vacation. And so I will be out of the office March 15th through April 5th. Um, I'll be available by email, cell phone, text message. Uh, my wife and I both have jobs where we certainly don't mind getting uh, phone calls at 3 a.m. It's part of what we do. So please feel free to reach out to me um, while I'm gone. And of course, I'll be checking in with city staff on a daily basis. While I'm out of the office, uh, Faye Stewart will be our acting city manager. So if we have another major weather event, uh, I want you to know you'll all be in great hands. 
Um, and assuming that technology cooperates, I uh, will attempt to attend the uh, March 25th, 2024 City Council meeting. Uh, so while I'm gone, please feel free to reach out to any of the uh, management team members uh, if you have any questions. And again, uh, I'm happy to uh, you know, answer any, re respond to any calls you might get. I'm far too pathologically paranoid not to check my email repeatedly during the day. So with that, that would conclude my report. Be happy to take any questions you might have. Any questions? Thank you. Report from the city attorney, Ms. Conley. Um, well, the legislature is has adjourned. They adjourned early. Um, the big news, I think, for most of our local governments is the passage of recreational immu immunity, um, kind of a quick fix uh, to address the city of Newport case. In that case, there was a trail that was used to access a recreational activity and um, particularly insurance companies, but all uh, entities that have trails that access recreational areas were very concerned, what do we do? I know that a number of trails have closed um, since the summer and since the Court of Appeals made that decision. So there's a quick fix that added um, improved trails to unimproved trails. There extends recreational immunity to both uh, as long as the improved trails aren't like recklessly poorly maintained. So there's some standard of responsibility that continues and is, I, I, you know, from my opinion, it's uh, expected. You, what If you're putting something out as improved, you don't want it to be hazardous. You don't want it to trap individuals. Um, we will see what happens next time around, the next legislative session. This set of amendments is in place until January 2nd of 2026, and then it shifts to a slightly different set of amendments, um, which has basically the same protections. And so that's uh, the legislature report that I wanted to just give you a quick update on. And then my other only other question is, I'm assuming that I should have the revised rules for the next meeting, um, although I just learned about this vacation. An, an absence potentially, and so I just wanted to con okay confirm. Yep, we'll move, we'll forge forward. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, now we will be moving into an executive session. Executive session pursuant to ORS 192.660 to conduct deliberations with persons designated by governing body to negotiate real property transactions. The City Council for Cottage Grove will now meet in executive session under the authority 192660. Representatives of the news media and designated staff shall be allowed to attend the executive session. Representatives of the news media are specifically directed not to report on any deliberations during the executive session, except to state the general subject of the session. No decisions may be made in executive session. At the end of executive session, council will return to council chambers and reconvene in this open session. This meeting is now in recess. All right, we'll go ahead and reconvene this meeting. It is 9.46. And Ms. Roberts, you had a couple things to add? I do, I'll be really quick. So I emailed uh, all of you this afternoon a memorandum regarding um, the SCI filing. So the SCI filing will be opening this Friday, March 15th. And so jump on it as quick as you can. The deadline's April 15th. And as you probably remember, there are penalties, financial penalties for not doing it in a timely manner. So watch for that email and do it as quick as you can. The other thing I want you to think about is that uh, Monday, May 27th, typically a council meeting, it's the fourth Monday of the month, happens to be Memorial Day. And while you don't need to make a decision tonight, you should probably start thinking about orders of business and if it should be moved to a different date. Um, have a Tuesday meeting or, or do something along those lines or not have the meeting, but just something to start thinking about. That's all I have. Thank you. All right, well, if there's nothing else, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>